All right, hello everybody. Welcome uh, to episode number five. Um, this one's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, today, I'm not gonna be doing sort of a tutorial or a how-to video on something that I've had to fix. I actually kind of want to show you a uh, looky what I got video. So um, this is my newest addition to uh, to the collection. You've seen a couple of my other rifles in previous videos. Um, this one I'm actually pretty proud of. I'm actually very surprised I was able to find this at a local gun store. Uh, here in Calgary and um, I, I kind of had to, I had no choice. Um, I have very much um, been in the market for any kind of a, a Mauser um, or a Mauser, Mauser action rifle um, <clears throat> and uh, the prices on them can just get a little bit crazy. I mean if you're looking at a Car 98 in Canada you're, you're expecting to spend $1,500 um, even an old Gewehr 98, if you can find them, um, probably going to be a couple thousand bucks. Um, what's interesting, though, when I say I, I've uh, always wanted a Mauser, I mean, even my uh, my brand new Remington 783 that I use for hunting is a Mauser action rifle. But, I mean, that just goes to show you how versatile um, the Mauser action was, um, the fact that it's still being used on uh, modern firearms today. This is not a true Mauser action. Um, if anybody knows anything about these rifles, uh, it's a combination of two other styles, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, this is specifically a uh, Portuguese Verguero uh, 1904-39. Now, disclaimer, I'm not Portuguese. I'm going to destroy some of the words I'm gonna try and pronounce today. And I do know that one of my subscribers specifically does speak Portuguese as his first language. So this video is for you, buddy. Be easy on me. <laughs> I'm going to try my best here. Um, anyway, this is a, uh, a 1904-39 Portuguese Verdiguero, also called a Portuguese Mauser. Um, but again, like I said, it's not a true Mauser. Um, the reason it's of 1904/39, I'll also get to in a second. Uh, 39 is basically the year in which these were uh, these were rearsenaled or re, uh, um, redone into the uh, the eight millimeter Mauser round. Um, but underneath the upgrade, there was still an original rifle, which is the 1904 Verguero, um, also called an Espingarda uh, 6.5. Um, when it was changed in 1939, it became the Espingarda. Um, Eight millimeter, so that's what I have here today. But uh, let's start with the with the 1904, which is the, the rifle underneath the upgrades. Um, this one in particular uh, was one of about a hundred thousand that were originally manufactured in 1904. Well, between 1904 and 1908, um, the develop sorry, it was developed in 1904, but they weren't actually really developed or manufactured until 1906. Uh, the last um, parts of the contract for completing in 1908. Um, also the same year that King Carlos I of uh, Portugal was actually assassinated. Um, if you look at the top of this gun, and I'll use my, uh, my little Lego poker here, um, you should see that but there's actually a crown and then a C and a one listed there. So that crown is the Royal Crown of Portugal. That's the, the crest of King Carlos, um, C and one being Carlos the first of Portugal, um, which actually makes it kind of interesting. So it's got Carlos's crest on the, uh, on the top of the receiver, um, cause that's why they were, they were manufactured between 1906 and 1908. Um, in 19, 10, um, during the October 5th revolution, the monarchy was disbanded in Portugal, yet they didn't remove the crest. So it's, it, I don't know if that was embarrassing to them to be uh, issuing out their troops with a, uh, a rifle with a monarch that they just previously disposed. Um, I don't know. Uh, disposed in 1910, the monarchy was dis dissolved. Uh, after 1908, when King Carlos was uh, assassinating his son, Manuel II actually took over for those two years. And he was disposed in 1910. I should clarify that. It wasn't Carlos that was disposed in 1910. He was already been dead for two years. Um, why there was 100,000 of these was produced was actually kind of an interesting story. Um, Portugal had just finished upgrading its most of its military to the new Kropacek black powder rifles in the late 1880s and um which was the most state of the one of the state of the, 
one of the most state-of-the-art uh, black rifle, uh, black powder rifles you could get on the market at the time in the military world. And so just at the time when most of the rest of Europe is switching over to smokeless powder, so Portugal had just spent a ton of cash in upgrading their military to the Kropatschek rifles and now realized that they were in last place when it came to the arms race in Europe because the rest of uh, Europe had moved on to uh, smokeless. So um, they obviously had to do something, so they developed this. Um, it originally was developed in a 6.5 very Yero essentially is what it is. I believe it's a 6.5 by 58, but I might be mistaken on that. I don't have the um, information in front of me right now. Um, but it was also, you will know it today as a 6.5 Portuguese round. It was a, um, a very small caliber, well, small caliber, 6.5-ish compared to the uh, the other stuff that was being issued out at the time. Uh, bottle nose, so actually a round nose cartridge versus a Spitzer. These are uh, Spitzer cartridges with the, uh, the point on the end there. Um, this one, if you look on the back side here, and I'll see if I can get this close enough to the camera to show everybody. Um, but this was manufactured at the, um, so it's an Espingarda Portuguesa 6.5 model. So they still have the uh, uh, the 6.5 on there. They did not cross it off, which a lot of them did after the um, the upgrades on here. And this was made at the Deutsche Waffen um, und, oh my goodness, I'm going to kill this word here, Munitions Fabriken. <laughs> factory which was actually located in Baden just north of, uh, of Switzerland so that's where these were originally manufactured so it was a contract paid by the Portuguese to a German manufacturer to provide or to produce these rifles in 1904 it took them a couple years to produce the 100,000 required uh, shipped back to uh, Portugal um, they were primarily issued out to um, Portuguese soldiers in Portugal the colonies had to maintain the old Kropatschek rifles um, there was a couple of intermediary rifles as well too that were used, um, but this one was primarily issued out to soldiers in Portugal during that time frame. Um, going back to the action on this, so again, the reasons why I absolutely love this rifle so much. Um, this is a combination of both the Mauser action as well as the Mannlicher style actions. The Mannlicher giving you the uh, uh, the split bridge on the receiver there. Um, the Mauser giving you the, the safety action, most of the bolt design, with the exception of the rotating front bolt. That's actually a carryover from the Mauser style. Um, it probably the smoothest action um, out of any of the rifles I have. I mean, I'm not even going to compare this to the Mosin again. That thing is you got to whack on that thing to get it to, to chamber rounds. Um, but even using or comparing this to my uh, my Swiss K11, which is more of a straight pull design, um, this is just so much more smooth than that. Um, even compare this to my SMLE. Um, that's a fantastic, fantastic action, but I, I love this one. This is amazingly smooth. Now, when I got this at the store, I could barely open this. Um, I didn't know if it was rusted in there. It would open, and it would open till about there. Um, if you really pushed hard on it, you could get it to open more, but I figured, okay, I was going to take a bit of a gamble. It could have been a bent lug. I, the bolt itself wouldn't have been bent, but there could have been something else in there. Perhaps it was the um, uh, the sear was stuck in an up position that was causing it to rub. When I got home, I quickly realized what the issue was. I have never seen so much, I'm going to call it grease in a rifle. It wasn't grease. It had hair in it. Um, there was bits of what looked like flesh when I cleaned it out. So I'm going to assume that when this was um, packaged up into the arsenal for long-term storage, uh, that they actually used animal fat. Um, I've heard of that happening in um, countries that say don't have uh, the type of money to be able to, or to be using their industrial uh, packing greases for long-term gun storage. So they use whatever they have readily available, which in like this case, I'm pretty sure was animal fat. It didn't smell like Cosmoline. Uh, Cosmoline or other packing greases, if anybody who's ever cleaned that out of a rifle um, will know, it's got a very distinctive chemical smell to it. Um, this did not have any of that smell, but when I was cleaning this out of there, good lord that was probably a good four and a half hours to clean everything out of there but it worked like an absolute charm i got everything out of here i got everything out of the receiver the barrel wasn't too bad uh when i actually took the uh the entire action out of the stock um all underneath it was just an ocean of fat and grease um a trigger assembly the um 
uh, the magazine. Um, it's an internal spring magazine here. That could, this spring didn't even function. It was just packed with grease. Um, so it was a lot of work and actually you can still see some of it still in there. Um, I haven't been able to clean this part out yet either, but this is going to give you a bit of an indicator of what was really in the entire rifle. This is all sort of hardened in there. Um, but once I got this out and cleaned out, um, I actually took it to the range, uh, this past weekend and fired off some rounds out of here. Didn't know if it was going to explode my hand, so I was obviously very cautious with the first couple of rounds, especially being a very high-powered 8mm round like this. Um, but wow, was it smooth. It loaded smooth, uh, it fired smooth, um, I had no issues about head space, there was no significant pitting on the barrel that I was worried about anything exploding there, just you never know when you're dealing with a rifle that is... Um, almost 120 years old uh, you just have to be careful with that stuff so um, but it was amazingly accurate which I always find amazing about something like so this again is a um, not a refurbished but it's redone into a different caliber than what it was originally designed for and in order to do that um, in 1939 and I guess I'm getting into that part of it I wanted to wait but it's okay let's dive into it so in 1939 you know what, actually, yeah, before I jump into that, let's do a little bit of a history thing here. So, in the 1930s, Portugal gets run by essentially a quasi-fascist government, very sympathetic to uh, Franco in Spain. And if you want to join the fascist party, you got to basically arm yourself like the fascists arm themselves. So everything moved over to the K-98, which is what the Germans were using um, in the 1930s and into World War II, um, which used... Uh, 7.92 by, oh my goodness, why can't I remember off the top of my head? 7.92 by 57? Uh, I'm sure I bugger that up. But anyway, it's an 8mm Mauser round. Um, so you, you got to join the party. So Portugal switched everything over to the K98 um, through their, uh, their normal military issue. But you still had, at the time, about 60,000 of these rifles left over that either hadn't been destroyed, hadn't been shipped off to the colonies, um, there was a, a contract of a number of these that were actually sold to the Union of South Africa, um, and then they used them down there. So then Portugal had to figure out, okay, well, we've got a supply of these. We're not a very wealthy country, so what do we do? Uh, let's convert them. The receiver, the barrel, everything can handle the higher pressure moving from the 6.5 uh, Verdiero round to the 8 millimeter Mauser. Um, so I, why not? It's cheaper. So I'm fairly certain that most of those 60,000 were shipped off to the Obendorf factory in Germany. Uh, they were rechambered. Um, the uh, barrel was cut down. So this barrel actually would extend normally a little bit further. Um, there was K98 sights out of the front, so that is very similar to what you'd see on a K98. Um, the other thing that they did is, uh, it's going to see if we can, sh this shows up on camera here, but if you look very closely you can see some numbers on the side of the old sight gauge there. Those are being grounded off or ground off and replaced with the actual K98 sight here. These would have been the old ones. So obviously when you're switching from a 6.5 millimeter um, bottlenose, very bottlenose rounds, by the way, are not very flat trajectory. They they drop quite a bit, um, even though it's a lighter round. It's just they're not as aerodynamic as a Spitzer round. Um, so you obviously cannot just send soldiers out into the field expecting them to be able to line up targets using the old sights here designed for a six and a half. So they ground those down and replaced it with the uh, with the newer sight that's on here. Um, the sights go all the way up to 2,000. This should be in meters, um, being Europe. Um, but yeah, it's just cool to see the old... Uh, uh, the old number is still on there. So they didn't, instead of just replacing this whole thing, they just ground that down, which I imagine had to be fairly precise um, tooling in order to do that uh, to get proper trajectory ratings out of the new 8mm Mauser round. Um, as well, too, you will typically find um, the 6.5 is X'd out or stamped out. This one does not have that. Um, it's now re-stamped up here. 8 by 57 ah, it was right, 8 by 57 and an S being Spitzer. Um, still left the, the crest on there, because why not? I guess Portuguese enjoy their history, so um, I can't complain. Um, these will also, I 
pretty sure this is the original stock that came with it, but it does not have any of the uh, um, the colony markings on the stock, which means that this was probably maintained in Portugal. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, stamps on the stocks from whatever colonies they've shipped out to. Um, side note, by the way, Portugal is a very funny country. During World War I, you had the Portuguese Expeditionary Force, which actually fought attached to uh, British units in Europe on the Western Front. Obviously, if you're going to attach another division of soldiers to your army, you're not going to let them bring their own rifles in their own weird, goofy um, caliber. You just give them what you have. And so the British issued them uh, SMLEs um, in the 303 British round. Um, in the colonies during World War One. if anybody sort of knows a lot about World War I, the war wasn't just in Europe. There was actually a, a whole side war going on at this time in Africa between the colonies. Um, Britain had colonies down there, Portugal had colonies down there, Spain had colonies down there, um, and most importantly, Germany had colonies down there. So when Germany declared war on the rest of Europe um, during the time of World War One, their colonies had to do something at the same time. So <laughs> Portugal had soldiers fighting for the Allies uh, in World War I in the Western Front, yet their colonies were fighting with the Germans against the British in Africa. Obviously still using old Kropatschik rifles, but that's kind of an interesting dynamic. I mean, I'm guessing there's a lot of um, independence <laughs> involved with your colonies if they can fight an entirely different side of the war than the main countries. Um, I couldn't imagine Britain trying that, but um, yeah, so anyway, that's a side point. Um, so, uh, anyway, after the, uh, the 1939 uh, conversions were completed, um, Portugal had switched over to uh, the K-98s as their standard weapon and actually used these and the K-98s all the way up to the 1960s. Um, there were a number of these that were rechambered into 7mm Mauser. Um, not a very large number of them. I don't have the number off the top of my head. I can't imagine it was more than maybe a couple thousand. And those were actually shipped to Brazil and used um, with some of the federal police forces there. Obviously, Portugal and Brazil having a very uh, uh, close relationship with each other. Um, so I don't know if those ones ever came back. I mean, if you can find um, one of these rifles chambered in seven millimeter, then you know that that was the one that came, uh, that was sent over to Brazil, because I'm pretty sure that was the only place that uh, had rechambered these things into seven millimeter Mauser. Everybody else was using the eight millimeter Mauser that I have here today. Um, if you can find one that was not redone, then that means it hid somewhere. Um, the Portuguese obviously were going to redo everything into 8mm Mauser. There was no reason to keep the 6.5 um, Verguero uh, caliber uh, cartridges um, after the conversion was done. So if you do happen to find one of those, they are probably one of the most rare military surplus rifles that you can find. Um, for this time period. I mean, obviously there's there's older stuff that's gonna be um, uh, more rare, but if you can find any of those, then it more than likely hit out in some colony in South Africa um, or somebody in Portugal hid it in a closet um, when they retired from the military and didn't wanna give it back to the government. Um, but they're incredibly rare. Uh, if you do happen to get one of those, good luck trying to find ammunition for it. You, you have to make it. I mean, there's no, um, you're not going into a store and saying, hey, can I buy a box of 6.5 um, Verguero? It's just it's not gonna happen. I mean, there's a million different kinds of 6.5 ammo out there. Your Swedish, um, your Caracano, but you're not going to find anything for this because there's just obviously these rifles cease to exist after 1939. So not this very one, this particular one was converted in 1939, but the base model of this rifle just ceased to exist after 1939. So anyway, there's your history lesson for the day. Um, there's obviously a lot of information that I've just kind of glossed over or briefly pointed at there. Um, I'm not a history expert. A lot of the information I'm getting off of this is just independent research that I've done, but um, there are some really, really good YouTube channels if you want to follow. I recommend a CNR Arsenal. Uh, Othias does a fantastic um, episode about the base model, the 1904, not the 1904-39, just the base 1904, the whole development leading up to it um, with the, uh, I don't even know if I mentioned the inventor's name, uh, not the inventor, the gentleman who designed the action it's uh, Jose Alberto Verguero and again I apologize if I butchered that name but uh, um, yeah 
sure a bit of a hero in Portugal for uh, coming up with this. Um, so anyway, this particular rifle, this this exact rifle, it's going to need a little bit of loving. Um, I have, obviously, the cleaning is probably about 90% done. I've still got some areas that will have to be cleaned up. This is one of them. Um, I did notice uh, a little bit more inside um, part of the action as well, too, when I took it. After I was done cleaning it, obviously, the rifle heats up. Some of that snot is going to find a way to leak itself out. And so I cleaned some of that out, which means it's coming from somewhere. So I got to keep finding that. Um, but there's some stuff I got to fix on this. So item number one. I'm missing my cleaning rod. So the cleaning rod would obviously slide right into here. Um, I don't have one. I have heard that the K98 cleaning rod will fit into this. Um, the thread sizes are supposedly the same. I will have to do a little bit of research on that. Um, but man, they're hard to find. I've looked everywhere online. I cannot seem to find a cleaning rod for this thing. Um, I also had to fix the um, uh, the front retention spring here for the band, or sorry, the, the I guess it'd be the rear band spring. Um, the wood underneath there, uh, how this works is it's essentially under spring pressure and then as the uh, band slides over, it bends down and then pops back up. Um, it was actually able to push very far down because the wood underneath there had actually rotted out quite a bit. And so when I pushed this band on, this just stayed down and the whole thing just keeps sliding off, which obviously you don't want to have happen because it's holding on a significant portion of the uh, the barrel in the front stock. And when you have a large round like that going off in here, there's a lot of vibration, movement, and things that could happen with this. And I just want to be very careful. I don't want to put that much pressure on this tiny little pin right here holding together the entire front assembly. Um, this is the bayonet lug. I will try and find myself a bayonet. Again, not easy to find. Um, I do, I'm very, very lucky in the city that I live in uh, there is a gentleman who owns a military surplus store in Calgary. Um, fantastic store. If you're ever in the Calgary area, things military, the guy's name is Bill. Absolutely amazing. But he specializes in bayonets. Um, he does, unfortunately, does not have the, uh, the 1904 Verguero bayonet for this one. I have also heard that, again, K98 bayonets may fit this, but I don't want that. I want the actual matching bayonet. I don't want somebody else's bayonet. So uh, he said he's going to keep it out for me. Uh, so I'll see if I can find one of those. Um, it'd be nice to get one of the actual leather slings uh, for this one. So I will keep an out for that. And then, unfortunately, I did break something on here. Uh, what I broke was right there. It's my bolt release screw. Uh, the very top half of it, or the top head broke off on there while I was cleaning this out. So what this does is if you want to take out the, uh, the bolt, that just opens up and then there's obviously a little latch in there that allows the bolt to pop out. Um, I was fiddling around with this yesterday and when I opened that up, I realized, wow, look at all the disgusting animal fat and grease that was in there. So I took off the bolt, took this out, cleaned it all out, put it back in. I should have been more careful because that bolt was 120 years old and so when I put it back in there, it was pitted all around the bot, the base of the uh, the screw head, and when I put it in there, it just snapped off. So it still works, and I mean, it is still threaded in there. So that's gonna be fun trying to get that out of there when I finally do find a replacement for this. I found one replacement online, but it requires replacing the entire thing, $60. I know, that's a little insane, just to try and get this pin back. So, I mean, for now it works. I'm just probably gonna leave it. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Uh, I think that's probably going to be the only thing I... Oh, yes. Okay. I don't know if you can see that there. <laughs> Some kind of rabid metal munching beaver has gotten a hold of that screw. Um, I don't know what on earth was going on when they were trying to take that screw off. Um... It was like that, obviously, when I got it. Um, it still works. The little set screw comes out just nice, and then the actual screw comes out. Um, but that is munged up pretty rough. Uh, I don't know what the person was trying to do, if they were trying to unscrew that with a bayonet or something. Um, the last time that this was taken off, or the 400 times before that, that it was taken on and off and put on, but that was munged up pretty bad. And then this one will be kind of hard to see here. 
that little screw, that's the set screw. Let me get my pokey. So that set screw right there is missing about 40% of the actual screw head. There is a small ridge of metal right there that allowed me to tighten it and untighten it, but that's not gonna last much longer because it's missing all the metal behind it. This screw is actually in amazingly good shape and this whole back end of the assembly is actually really, really good, but I'm gonna have to replace that set screw because one of these days I'm gonna be taking that off and that really, really thin, about two millimeter thin piece of metal is gonna snap off and now I've only got half a screw head and good luck trying to get that out of there. And being a set screw, you need to take that out in order to take the actual screw out in order to be able to take the entire trigger assembly out. Um, okay, something else that's actually really interesting about this one versus the uh, the K98s. Um, they copied the um, uh, the magazine floor, but what's interesting on this one is it attaches on the one side, so it doesn't. It's not actually a completely removable um, uh, magazine and follower. So I mean, you can still get your ammunition out this way if you really need to. Um, but I mean, what's a soldier going to do when you give him something on his rifle that can be detached? He's going to lose it because that's what soldiers do not this one so yeah they thought of that as well smart guys those portuguese um other than that i'll leave you off with the uh the ammunition for it uh if you watched my video on um lee enfield stripper clips i really wish whoever designed those stripper clips had um maybe learnt or paid attention to the germans because they've been using these stripper clips for a very very long time and good lord are these the smoothest it's just amazing at how easy this thing is to load off of these clips. There is absolutely no, re uh, I mean, there's just enough resistance to keep that on the clip itself. It was not going anywhere. Um, but it's not going to fight me when I try and load it into the rifle. Um, plus, Mauser just had a really great, great um, design too with their clips where um, as you... As you load it, I'm obviously not going to do it now because the bolt's in here, but as you load the clip in there, push down on the rounds, you don't have to then spend the extra half a second taking the clip out. You just close it and the clip flies right out. So, I mean, that's just, it's just cool that they thought of that. Um, it's also got the safety on the back here, which is the old uh, flag safety safe. That's obviously not going to, can't even open it. And then fire. Um, yeah, but you know what? That is my brand new 120 year old um, Portuguese Verguerero Espingarda 1904-39. Um, I love this thing. I'm going to take very good care of it. I got to do a lot of cleaning up on it and fix some stuff as I've shown you, but um, I hope you've enjoyed this video um, and uh, I look forward to seeing what else we can uh, we can share with you guys. So again, thank you very much for watching. Uh, leave a comment if you have any questions um, or give me a like because this is a brand new channel and I obviously want to uh, um, see if I can get this to grow. The more that I can grow, the more material I can share with you guys. So again, thank you very much. You guys have yourself a fantastic day and we'll chat again soon.